A strange behavior of future shaman have not failed to attract the attention of scholars, and from the middle of the past century, by which he meant the 19th century, several attempts have been made to explain the phenomenon of shamanism as a mental disorder. But the problem is wrongly put. For on the one hand, it's not true that shamans always are, always have to be neuropathics or neurotics or people who are not well put together mentally. On the other hand, those among them who had been ill became shaman precisely because they had succeeded in becoming cured. So what that means is these are people who have undergone some kind of existential crisis, sometimes one that's induced, you know, as part of the process that turns them into shaman, but they were able to undergo that existential crisis and then put themselves back together. And so that's what makes the masters of the, of the chaotic realm, so to speak. And so if you're starting to fall apart and you don't know what to do, well, the best thing you can possibly do is find someone who's been there and come back. And that idea of going somewhere and coming back is also a very, very common mythological story. So that's the story that, of, the, of, of the Hobbit, for example. Right? Because the Hobbit goes off on this quest, and he undergoes all sorts of trials, and he encounters the dragon that lives underneath everything, and he gets the gold from the dragon, which is the information that the dragon stores. And then he comes back to his community, and he's transformed. But he's strange. Like, he's going off on this big adventure, and now he's like well put together and tough, and he's also rich. But he's also peculiar, you know. When, when, when Bilbo, so Bilbo goes back to the Shire, you know, everybody, no one's exactly sure what to do with him because now he's contaminated with everything that he's gone through. So he's, he's like an agent of chaos himself, you know, and someone who's somewhat terrifying. But, you know, useful if you have to have a consultation about how you might deal with the next dragon. So, now I said that a lot of the shamanic initiatory rituals seem to be associated with the loose use of hallucinogenic drugs. And so the most common ones that we know about are mushrooms. So, for example, there's this mushroom, which many of you have probably seen in fairy tales, right? And that's on the cover of fairy tales very frequently. And that's called an Amanita muscaria mushroom. And it's generally viewed as extremely toxic. And there's some, there's some reason for that, because it can, it can make the people who eat it very sick. And now and then people do die from it. But mostly, it's extraordinarily hallucinogenic. The Vikings, for example, this is quite a terrifying story. The Vikings used to take Amanita muscaria mushrooms before they went on their pillaging trips. And they used the mushrooms to transform themselves into the equivalent of predatory monsters. So they usually, their, their sort of target was wolves or bears. And the, the word berserk, which is what the Vikings used to go, meant bear shirt. And so they would train their young men to eat these hallucinogenic mushrooms and turn themselves into pain-free predators. And then they would take them before they went on a pillaging raid. And so you just imagine, you know, you're sitting there in northern England and you're in your village and it's all peaceful and these bloody, crazy Vikings come out of the, out of the ocean and the boats, you know, the open boats that they've traveled across the North Sea in, and they're all like stoned out of their gourd on Amanita muscaria mushrooms and all convinced that they're like predatory bears and that's exactly how they're acting and they have no pain whatsoever and it's like, <laughs> that's not a good scene. That's not a good scene, you know, and the Vikings come through and they just destroy everything. It's like, so that's, they're used, they were used for martial purposes by the Vikings. But they're, 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 they're a drug that's used very commonly by people who are inducing shamanic experiences among themselves across the whole northern part of Europe and Asia, and they grow almost everywhere. So you know, those are the original magic mushroom, you know, the magic red mushroom with the white dots. And you, if you look, in, you can see these things in, in drawings everywhere, especially in fairy tales, very common representation of fairy tales. Um, there is some evidence that religions that are I suppose in some ways more articulated and sort of sophisticated in that they're more articulated like Christianity, say, compared to the more sh shamanic uh, religions, uh, have also have their roots in hallucinogenic experience. And this may be true to a degree that we really don't understand. So, for example, this is something, this is taken from the Edwai manuscript, which is 11th century, fundamentally, 11th to 13th century, because there were copies of it made at different times. But what you see here is... It's mind-boggling, really, is that the tree that the snake is associated with is a psilocybin mushroom. And that's a very characteristic representation of a psilocybin mushroom. And the, and the fruit that Eve is feeding to Adam is part of the psilocybin mushroom. And there is speculation, you know, among people who are sort of at the fringes of, of evolutionary theory that part of the way that human beings levered themselves up into increased consciousness was by the use of mushrooms. And you can see 
in the in the representations over there. Some of them are absolutely remarkable, like the one on the top right hand corner there. That's Christ, and he's standing there like like this with his hands up. And then underneath the, the, the bottom half of that circle is a psilocybin mushroom, with the head is in uh, the, the, like the main body of the mushroom is in the same position as Christ's head, and the like the offshoots of the mushroom are in the same position as his hands. So. Well, God only knows what that means. So that's that's very strange and, and, and a remarkable thing. And we really don't know what to make of it. And there's a lot more investigation to be done than that. This is an ayahuasca vine, and it's the it's part of what the Amazonian shamans used to brew their hallucinogenic mixtures. And no, none of the uh, Westerners who've gone to study the Amazonian shaman can figure out how the hell they determined how they were going to make their mixture because it's virtually impossible to make. You need to take the vine and then you need to take another plant that doesn't grow in the same place and you have to mix them together in the right proportions and then you have to cook them together for 72 hours and you have to do that without breathing in any of the vapors. And you know, there's thousands and thousands of different kinds of plants in the Amazonian jungle and it isn't obvious in any way how the people who are using these mixtures figured out how to make them. And if you ask them, they say, well, the plants told us how to do it. And, you know, that for modern Western people, that's not much of an explanation. But it's certainly the explanation that the tribesmen seem to stick to. And, you know, God only knows how people gather their information. You know, chimpanzees use medicinal plants. You know, they're, they're capable of finding plants in their habitat, they can eat that are emetic or so on that, that help them deal with diseases. And it's not clear at all how they figured that out. So there's lots of mysteries about the origin of human knowledge, that's for sure. So uh, three sources of potential visionary experience. And this is very interesting. So here's the biochemical construction of hallucinogenic chemicals. So the first thing you see on the bottom right is a serotonin molecule. Now, serotonin is, in some ways, it's the major brain neurotransmitter. And the reason I say that is because during your embryological development, your brain grows out, you know, it sort of, sort of flowers forth. And it's guided in its development by the serotonin system, the, the system that uses serotonin as its primary neurochemical transmitter. So it's, it's not only in our very archaic system, and it's so old that you share it, as I've mentioned before, with crustaceans, but it's also the system that sort of puts you together as you emerge out of nothing. And so you see its peculiar chemical structure there, and then you see these are all different hallucinogenic substances. Um, this one is psilocybin, for example, and um, they're all, and DMT is a very weird chemical, it's very illegal DMT. It produces, it's part of ayahuasca, although ayahuasca is made with a plant that contains DMT, and then something called an MAO inhibitor, which decreases the rate at which your body breaks it down. But pure DMT produces an instantaneous 10 minute. A hallucinogenic high that people, where people constantly report contact with aliens. And there's a psychiatrist who spent years documenting DMT experiences, and every single person he, he, con he, he walked through the experience with reported the same thing. They're shot out of their body, they're immediately in an alien landscape. So, well, you know, what, what that seems to indicate is that, you know, from a, from a more purely rational perspective, is that these chemicals produce characteristic experiences that are so associated with visionary experience. They put you in something that's like a dream state. Now, oddly, the dream state seems to be somewhat similar from person to person, but there are ways that, in, in some sense, that the, un the contents of the unconscious mind can be made manifest to the conscious mind, at least for, for brief periods of time. Sometimes that can be clearly horrifying, because sometimes people take these, these, these chemicals and have, like, the worst experience of their life. And part of that seems to be associated with the sort of thing that might happen to you in psychotherapy. So, for example, if you were convinced that your psyche wasn't very well ordered and you were harboring sort of dark secrets and lies and all the sorts of things that might complicate your life and all sorts of familial pathology and, you know, cultural baggage and, like, the horrors that sort of live inside your brain, you know, in psychotherapy you would sort of confront those one by one. In a hallucinogenic experience you might confront all of those at the same time. You know, and for, for many people, that's exactly equivalent to a quick trip to hell. And it's not something they'd rather repeat. So, you know, why, that, why things are set up that way? Well, who knows? You know? I mean, we don't really understand these things. Huh?
Thank you.